What you're looking at here is a uh, an oil and gas uh, structure um, in the Gulf of Mexico, and you're seeing a methane plume coming from that structure and then being carried by the wind. So before I forget, I want to show you um, I've closed the doors and windows in my office and on my Aeronet 4 CO2 detector, it's 829 uh, parts per million of CO2 at the moment in this room. And I'll try to remember to show you this uh, sensor periodically throughout this video uh, so you can see how quickly the CO2 level can rise in an enclosed room and it's a good proxy for air quality because from the CO2 level um, in a particular indoor space you can calculate um, how much if other people were in the room you could calculate how much of the air that they were breathing out you were breathing in whether it was one percent or five percent or ten percent when the CO2 level gets extremely high that number gets extremely high too. that percentage okay so so basically um, what I'm going to talk about in this video um, is the details on methane pollution on offshore oil rigs and also from the Permian Basin. So we have very good instrumentation, very high resolution uh, spectrometers. Um, you can call them hyper uh, spectral spectrometers measuring that can measure um, CO2, nitrous oxide, methane, many other things, and it can measure the point source emissions for, for methane in particular. Um, it turns out that there's really bad super emitter sites all over the planet um, where vast amounts of methane <coughs> are released, and it's a very simple matter um, of detecting these things with present day technology, whether it be satellite based sensors or um, low flying aircraft with this, with these hyperspectral spectrometers on them. Um, and you can pinpoint locations where in, you know, a city like the gas meter on a particular house could be leaking and that can be detected from above. And it's a very simple matter to fix these leaks. And, you know, we need, um, crash programs to do that because you know, methane is rapidly rising in the atmosphere. So I'm going to talk all about um, these sort of things, including the fact that um, low concentrations of methane in the atmosphere that are venting from oil rigs can actually cause helicopter crashes. Um, the way the helicopter engine is set up, there's a compressor um, which compresses the gases, um, from like to, to, you know, the air, right? It needs the oxygen to run the engine. Uh, but if there's any low level concentration of volatile substance like methane or ethane in the air coming up from the oil rigs, then that'll be, that can be actually compressed enough so that it reaches ignition and the engine basically loses power and the helicopter just plummets from the air, you know, and, uh, you know, these sort of so-called, quotes, unexplained helicopter crashes. And there's actually, you know, quite a few of them. Um, and there's an agency that looks at it. Um, and, um, but there's a lot of pushback from the oil industry. So I want to talk about all of these things in detail. This will be a long video, so I apologize in advance. It's going to be, um, it's going to, it's going to be one of my longer, longer videos. Okay, so let's get right into the, um, right into the, the nitty gritty. Okay, and I'll keep this CO2 sensor in sight so I can sort of tell you readings if it goes up substantially. I feel like there's moving air in here. Maybe I forgot to shut a window, but that'll tell me something too. Okay, so this article came out recently in Desmog 
growing body of research suggests offshore oil's methane pollution is underestimated. Previous efforts to regulate offshore em methane emissions have stalled despite the role of methane in helicopter crashes. Um, okay, so here, here's an example of a plume that can be captured um, by just an infrared camera being carried in a helicopter or aircraft above, above an oil rig. So here we go, uh, you know, flying 10,000 feet above the Gulf of Mexico. The plane can be outfitted with infrared imaging equipment. And you can see methane gas bubbling under the water, likely from an undetected pipeline leak. You know, there were many, in, in these flights, you can see frequent methane gas plumes from platforms, storage tanks, and pipelines offshore. The 151 platforms near the Louisiana coast had a much higher methane leak rate than what's been measured for onshore oil and gas production. Okay, the bottom line is that there's lots of emissions in the shallow waters that are currently unmeasured coming from the oil and gas industry. Um, and there is a study which I'll go through in detail that's referenced here. The thing that's changed is we have new technologies now to actually measure the oil and gas methane emissions like never before, whether from leaks or intentional flaring and venting. So flaring is when you just, um, when you actually burn, you set fire to the gas escaping, you flare it off. And venting is just if you allow the methane to just go through pipes and directly into the atmosphere. Now, as far as climate is concerned, venting is much, much worse than flaring because flaring, you're burning the methane, converting it into CO2 and water. And of course, CO2 uh, is as bad as CO2 is for warming. The methane has a much higher global warming potential. So you're converting that methane into CO2. There's still, you know, it's still not great, but um, it's better to, you can't just vent it into the atmosphere. It's, it's horrible flaring at least is a bit better. The reason why these are done at all is because, um, you know, it's because it's methane is a gas, you know, as opposed to capturing the oil, you know, liquids, transporting liquids is a lot easier than transporting gases. They don't have the infrastructure out at the oil rigs to capture the methane, unless it's close to the shore and there's a pipeline or something, um, or there's a ship nearby that can have the methane, but that's not done. It's not economical. So the oil and gas industry doesn't do that. But there's been a lot of push. Um, the operators um, for onshore rigs, they say that methane levels are much better, but that's actually not, not the case. Um, research shows that that is not the case. So just to give you an idea, about 15% of US oil production and 1% of US natural gas production. You know, natural gas is a bit of a misnomer. Um, basically, it's methane. Um, so, you know, this sort of, these percentages come from federal leases in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they're far from land and oversight. It's a wild west out there that makes it easy for companies to fudge numbers and avoid accountability from regulators who acknowledge they've fallen short. Even as questions emerge about how methane emissions may be contributing to helicopter crashes around oil and gas platforms. Okay, now with the rise in natural gas prices, price spikes in natural gas, it's incentivized some companies to try to quantify how much money they're losing to leaky systems by using infrared cameras capable of detecting methane, the primary ingredient in natural gas, and of course, a potent contributor to climate change. Now, operators in the Permian Basin in Texas and New Mexico. Now, this is the, the this is sort of the granddaddy of all oil and gas production in the U.S. The Permian Basin, forty percent of U.S. oil and fifteen percent of U.S. gas is produced in the Permian Basin. There's about a four uh, percent leakage rate of natural gas. So what, about 4% of the natural gas that comes out of the ground leaks into the atmosphere directly, and that's without flaring. You know, it's mostly unnoticed by the industry. Natural gas 
loss rates, leakage rates in the oil rigs in the offshore platforms in the shallow water of the Gulf of Mexico is 23%, huge. Because offshore production is so much lower, the total volume of lost gas is likely much higher onshore. But, you know, these are problems. We shouldn't be leaking methane anywhere. Now, there's problems with oversight. So after the ocean, after the, um, after the, the major oil disaster in the Gulf with BP, the U.S. started a new agency called the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, BS. EE. It regulates the offshore energy industry, but and it's acknowledged gaps in accountability that could be enabling more pollution, such as unverified self-reported emissions numbers and flyover inspections that fail to detect pipeline leaks. Um, the agency has also fallen short in past efforts to enact more stringent methane pollution control measures, even when platform emissions caused helicopter crashes. Okay, for years, federal agencies have known that relatively low levels of methane gas can cause engine failure in most helicopters operating offshore, but they failed to implement regulatory changes that would require methane detection systems to alert helicopter pilots and other workers of the presence of the colorless, odorless gas. Remember that methane naturally is odorless. Once, once if you're on land, utility companies like natural gas companies, they add a chemical that smells like rotten eggs to natural gas to make it easier to detect dangerous gas leaks. I've said in the past, I've called it H hydrogen sulfide, H2S, but no, it's, uh, it's something called mercaptan. And I'll just show you, um, this is mercaptan. Okay, it's a chemical that they can add um, it smells like rot garlic or rotting cabbage. We can, the human nose can detect mercaptans as small as 10 parts per billion concentration. So it's an effective odorant. You put it in the gas that's like meth meth methane, the natural gas. And then if there's a leak in a house, you, people can smell it and get out. So it's a safety measure. So it's added. Okay, now the BSEE, the inspection process doesn't detect or didn't detect when a fossil fuel company that had that manipulated or misreported methane emissions data across four platforms in the Gulf of Mexico over a five year period. So they, they investigated, there were complaints, confidential tips, they investigated it and they found that the venting and flaring limits was routinely exceeded from its platforms on federal leases. So the company, uh, basically paid a fine, you know, 712,000, whoop de doo Okay, so they, it was easy to spot. This company um, that um, they, they basically, um, you know, they're, they're, they claimed that their renting and emissions didn't change at all over each year, right, for example. Like it was very easy, it was so easy to catch them, but they went undetected for many, many years. Okay, so this is a problem. Typically, the amount of methane released through venting or burning, through flaring, fluctuates with the amount of oil produced. But this company reported venting the same amount of pollution every day from one platform for nearly two years, regardless of the amount of oil produced. <laughs> okay, so they were really stupid. Um, they also reported some flaring and venting as routine, despite it being more than allowed by regulatory limits and outside the company's permit. So, you know, they were nailed, but it was pretty obvious and it required a complaint. The regulatory agency didn't find them by this by themselves. And also, there's also undetected methane gas leaks in pipelines offshore. So where the regulators require companies to conduct monthly inspections of underwater pipes by a helicopter or boat to look for bubbles on the water surface visible to the naked eye. But there's obviously a big problem here. Um, I mean, pipeline pressure sensors are not generally reliable indicators of pipeline leakage if the leakage is a small fraction of the gas going through the pipe. 
In California, they need companies to perform underwater inspections of active pipelines, but they don't do that in the Gulf. So easily, here's what happens, of course. You have a leak here. Uh, oil and gas is coming out, and the currents, the ocean currents carrying it, carry it far from the source. So a helicopter flying over this location where it knows the pipeline is won't see a darn thing. You know, it would be down current where the bubbles and oil would be spilled. So it's it's ridiculous to, to use this method. Okay, it just doesn't work. Curbing methane emissions from the fossil fuel industry is one of the most cost-effective ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, according to the UN Global Methane Assessment. But they just haven't done it. In, in, there's regulatory gaps that have deadly consequences. So here we go, leaking methane, crashing helicopters. So in 2014, federal officials warned the regulatory agency, BSEE, that vented methane gas has been sucked into the engines of helicopters, landing on and departing from offshore platform, causing the engines to fail and the helicopters basically to fall out of the sky. A review of accidents found that helicopters had likely plunged into the Gulf of Mexico every 1.5 years between 1992 and 2014 because of off gas, because of gas coming from the infrastructure. And this was in a 2015 report commissioned by the BSEE. So where's the latest report? Right? No sign of it. I mean, this article is a new article. It's just from uh, 2023, a month ago or so. Um, they're talking about reports written, you know, eight years ago, and they're giving a time frame, you know, 1992 to 2014. Well, let's look at this. This is a this is about uh, about 22 years, so that means one helicopter is dropping out of the sky, um, you know, every 1.5 years. So that's about um, what? That's 15 helicopter uh, crashes in this time period. And we know this is still going on. I'll just show you an article of a couple crashes in December, just, uh, you know, just uh, four or five months ago. Okay, so they're still happening. It's just harder to see that, find the data on them. So after this warning, after this report, the BSEE, they sought regulatory input to prevent future helicopter crashes from methane gas. So they considered requiring methane gas detectors to give pilots a warning when gas was present. Um, but the fossil fuel industry pushed back and the agency's efforts were completely stalled. So it never happened. There was no regulation. You can easily have a, have a forward-looking infrared camera in a helicopter so that you don't fly into a methane pr plume. It's very, very cheap to do. They better darn well have them now on the helicopters, but I couldn't find any information on that. Um, the American Petroleum Institute and... Um, they said that the ability to detect methane would not mitigate the consequences of potential methane intake. <laughs> right? I mean, this is this is uh, this is ridiculously false. Right? A forward-looking camera on a helicopter, you see a plume, you just avoid it. Right? It's very simple if you played around with infrared cameras. So this is this is utter utter nonsense. They say that operational discipline, adequate training, effective communication protocols between facilities like an oil rig and helicopter pilots are crucial to maintaining safe operations. Well, I think the helicopters are still going down. Um, the press secretary did not answer questions about what the agency's done to prevent future helicopter crashes because of methane, methane venting. Um, they've said previously the problem can be extremely dangerous and impacts offshore workers and the agency's own personnel. The UK has implemented its own regulations after they had, uh, you know, helicopter problems back in 1995. So they require air modeling of platforms to ensure that the helipads are not in the path of methane emissions. The visual warning system required is required that flashes red when methane pollution is above a dangerous concentration level, according to UK standards. So, you know, I guess UK lives and Norwegian lives where they do these things are, uh, those lives are more important than American lives, according to this, this guy's comment. Okay, um, so last year, this is talking about 2022 now, 
Several helicopters traveling to and from oil platforms crashed in the Gulf, including two in December that appeared that appear similar to earlier crashes caused by methane gas. Like previous crashes caused by methane venting, the helicopters were just above a platform before they dropped out of the sky. The NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, has not identified the causes of the crashes. No federal agency currently oversees the safety of helicopters traveling to and from oil platforms. Get a load of this. Workers who die in helicopter crashes are not counted in offshore incident statistics. For this reason, it's not clear if methane gas has caused any recent helicopter crashes, right? Because they don't, you know, don't keep the information, pretend it doesn't happen. Meanwhile, people die. Okay, the NT... SB spokesperson told the smog and remember this was this was this article was from February of 2023 regarding the rotorcraft crashes in December of 2022 those investigations are still ongoing and no determination has yet been made about cause or factors okay here we go the industry's leaky logic fossil fuel companies they justify drilling for oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico by claiming that it emits fewer greenhouse gases than drilling anywhere else in the world, in part because of offshore restrictions on venting and flaring methane. They say that um, oil production in the U.S. Gulf has among the lowest greenhouse gas emission intensity in the world, with half the carbon intensity of other producing regions while also outperforming the rest of the world in methane emissions. I mean, these, these statements are verifiably false, according to the uh, scientific studies that measure methane um, in these regions. Okay, I mean, they just said this in October of 2022. They said this to federal officials right in the next five-year offshore leasing plan. The Inflation Reduction Act included 850 million for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to fund methane reduction measures from oil and gas facilities. But um, this guy here, BP of National Ocean Industries, says he's not aware of any offshore energy companies pursuing government funding to address methane emission reduction. So the money is there, but they're not even doing it. They don't, you know, if they do it, I guess they have to publish a report and then it shows that it's a problem. So they don't even want to use that funding to address methane. Here, here's money. Address your methane emissions reductions. They don't even do it, the energy companies. Right? So <laughs> they say here, methane emissions are tightly controlled for offshore operations and are very low when compared to other producing regions. Right? Uh, but you know, scientific studies, study just last year, more and more research is showing that offshore methane emissions are underreported, especially in shallow waters of the Gulf. This pokes a hole in the industry's argument that offshore drilling has the lowest greenhouse gas emissions intensity in the world. Okay, what we do know is that there is a hell of a lot more methane being released from offshore drilling than what is publicly what was publicly known before, but now the scientific studies are showing it's a problem, you know, up to 23% leakage rates in some regions. The Department of Interior, which is the group under which the BSEE falls under, it needs to crack down on methane emissions. The regulators are not doing their job. Okay, so that's the, the bottom line. Um, just Google the title and, and look at this. It's surprisingly scary. Um, it's unbelievable what the fossil fuel industry can get away with. Unbelievable. Okay, um, here's a paper. There's lots of these papers in environmental science and technology. They're open source. So methane emissions from offshore oil and gas platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so they measured, they had a ship going up and down um, for, for weeks in the Gulf of Mexico. Shipboard measurements of offshore oil and gas facilities were conducted in the Gulf of Mexico in February of 2018. This is a 2020 paper. They measured, every second they took measurements of methane, ethane, 
carbon-13, heavy isotope of carbon, and deuterium, heavy isotope of hydrogen, isotopes of methane, several com combustion tracers. There was significant variability in the emission composition between individual sites, typical ethane to methane ratios about 5.3%, and methane isotopic compositions, okay, they did isotopic analysis. Offshore plumes were spatially narrower than expectations of the plume width based on atmospheric stability, terrestrial atmospheric stability classes, dispersion methodology, how the gas disperses. So the plume widths were much narrower they looked than expected. They looked at 103 sites, including shallow and deep water offshore platforms and drill ships. They measured methane emission rates from nothing to 190 kilograms per hour. The distribution skewed. The top two emitters accounted for 20% of the total methane emissions of all sampled sites. Um, okay, so, and they described the equipment that they use and its spectrometers, and it's not that expensive. So there's an oil rig and there's some of the data, but I'll, I'll talk about this. This is a key curve. This is the number of sites. This is the emission rate in kilograms per hour. Lots with zero, and but there's some that are extremely high. And those those few that are extreme, the top two emitters way out here, are, account for 20% of the total methane emissions from all the sampled sites. There you go, like these super emitters. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's just scan this and have a look at some of the facts about offshore oil and gas methane. Um, that hasn't re received the same attention from the measurement community as onshore assets. The US EIA has projected that oil production in the Gulf of Mexico would account for 16% of total US production in 2018 and 2019. Globally, offshore oil production accounted for about 30% of the overall production in 2015 and is increasing. So offshore production platforms are structures used to drill and service wells on the ocean floor. They may have compressors, some treatment equipment like separators, and often have equipment for use in workovers. A large variety of platform types are in operation. Equipment is also placed underwater. This includes wells marked by valve manifolds and flow lines, pipelines connecting multiple wells. Umbilicals from surface platforms are needed to mo power, monitor, and control subsea equipment. There could be fluid lines for chemical injections, if you're like fracking type stuff. Um, and you can pipe stuff directly to shore if you're close enough, or it can go into a floating production storage and offloading vessel. Um, okay, so it's, they're not like, these offshore platforms are not like well pads on land. They have an extremely varied function. They op occupy multiple spots in the offshore oil and gas supply chain. Okay, uh, when they just they describe deep water production is depths greater than 125 meters deep, and that accounts for a third of total U.S. offshore production, well, 36 percent. Okay, so what they did is. Um, okay, so the deep water horizon in 2010. After that leak, they started the agency, the BSEE, to monitor things, so it's not that old. There wasn't a lot of methane coming out in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill because it was in deep water. The Elgin platform gas leak in the UK North Sea in 2012, uh, there was a lot of methane from that one because the, the problem was on the platform itself, not under the water. Okay, so what they did, this paper presents shipboard measurements downwind of offshore oil and gas platforms in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Texas and Louisiana between February 12, 2018 and February 22, 2018. So it just looked at 10 days. Okay, and they used uh, tunable infrared laser direct absorption spectroscopy. So they used a a laser which could be tuned, it operated in the infrared, they could tune it to the absorption line of methane and pick out methane um, and, and measure the concentration by the amount of absorption. Okay, so there's a lot of details on that, but it's not too expensive, it's well known, it's a spectrometer. 
Okay, well, here is some of the, here's a map. This is Galveston, Grand Isle. These are all different. This is the direction of the ship, the black line. Um, this is, uh, these are all different sites. The, the green ones they plan to go to. They went to some others fortuitously and they uh, post analysis site. So they measured the, the gas, million cubic feet per day, the emissions from different places. And you can see some of the, some of the data here. Okay, uh, so basically let's have a look at the data here. Okay, so this is ethane, um, this is uh, deuterium. Let's have a look at the, okay, so here we go. So this is a key, graph. So this is the number of site counts. So 60 of them had zero, right? And the rest of them had some emissions. These two up here, they, they accounted for 20% of the total emissions. So if you just found, fi fix a leak there, fix these ones here, these ones here, you'd, you'd, you'd have way fewer methane emissions. The water depth is less than a thousand feet for the red ones. The blue ones is greater than a, a thousand feet. Okay, and it's emissions, uh, the emissions per kilograms per hour is the emissions. Um, this is a log linear scale. This is a logarithmic scale now. Okay, so you can see the peak here is about, uh, you know, the peaks at about 20 kilograms per hour. Okay, it's slightly skewed. It's a bit slightly skewed. These emitters here are uh, about the, the 200 kilograms per hour. Okay, so you can see the distribution. Um, this is a distribution of ethane. There's ethane uh, coming out of the whole region. And those are the key factors. Okay, so you can we can measure it. So why aren't companies forced to measure their own leaks and to cap their leaks? And they'll save money. <laughs> right? because uh, they'll save money. They're just too damn lazy. They don't use the technology. I don't know what reason there is with today's technology, simple spectrometers. There's no way, like it's criminal that this is happening, you know, given the climate problem. Okay, so let's talk a little bit. Here's an article. Um, this is from, this is um, published. This is a Western Louisiana, I guess. Uh, you know, an article December 29, 2022, it talks about a helicopter crash off the Louisiana coast. Okay, so there was a helicopter crash about 10 miles off the coast, four people killed, um, oil rig worker, the pilot, um, doesn't say who else. This is just talking. This guy's had bad, this, she's had bad luck. She lost her husband in the helicopter crash and her kid um, had a, drowned in an accidental drowning. And she's pregnant with a second little boy as of, as of uh, you know, maybe she's had the kid already. Anyway, horrendous. Okay, so this is some debris that they recovered. Not much. This is the helicopter pad that the helicopter, uh, you know, was near and crashed from. Okay, two weeks ago, two weeks prior to that, the Coast Guard rescued three people after a helicopter crashed while attempting to land on an oil rig platform. Okay, that crash was December 15th, roughly 60 miles west of the area the Coast Guard was searching. Okay, so two crashes in December of last year. This is another article, um, you know, showing, you know, rescue divers trying to, trying to find people right after the accident occurred. Okay, that was the, the crash on December 29th. And some of the pictures the same. Okay, just from another, uh, another article on it. Okay, well, what about the reporting, at least of the fatalities? You know, you can we assume that everybody that dies working offshore on oil rigs, that their fatalities are recorded, at least by this federal safety agency? Uh, no, no, we can't. This this is a boom, and they're flaring methane here, actually. Okay, nearly half of known Gulf of Mexico worker fatalities, they don't fit the agency's reporting criteria. Okay the BSEE. 
Okay, so they talk about the BP Deepwater Horizon, April 20th, 20, uh, 2010. Platform exploded, killing 11 workers, triggering one of the worst environmental disasters in U.S. history. Okay, remember that one? The explosion spilled 4 million barrels of oil. It's come to symbolize the riskiest era in offshore drilling because the spill spurred new safety and environmental regulations. Okay, so in the wake of the disaster, the federal government created the BSEE, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, or BSEE, to improve safety and enforce environmental regulations in the offshore oil and gas industry. However, an investigation, and this, this, is, a, this is from an article is from August 2021, the an investigation found that the number of offshore worker deaths is being undercounted by the agency. Inconsistent and missing data, as well as loopholes that allow some fatalities to go unreported, make the offshore industry appear safer than it really is. So they they're not they're, they're nearly half of known offshore worker facilities now look known. How many do we not know about? But nearly half of those in the Gulf of Mexico from 2005 to 2019. They didn't fit the BSEE reporting criteria, according to our data provided by the agency in response to a Freedom of Information Act request. Okay, um, even with this undercount, the most recent data released by the agency indicates there were six offshore worker fatalities in 2019. Um, but the, the reports on their own website don't match their own raw data. So they report on their own website and they're not even counting some of those deaths, you know, in their official counts. Okay, there were three additional deaths among offshore workers. This was in 2019, not reported by BSEE. So they reported six, didn't report three. Two of them were in a helicopter crash heading out to a rig. And one that law enforcement determined was not work related. Okay, somebody had a heart attack. I guess. And here's an example. In April 2021, six men died, seven went missing after a lift boat capsized on its way to an oil and gas lease in the Gulf. They won't be counted towards the 2021 offshore fatality statistics, a BSEE spokesman said. So what's the point of this agency? <laughs> like, this is crazy stuff. You got to look at the details. Of the 83 known offshore worker fatalities, that occurred between 2005 and 2019, about 30% of them were classified as non-occupational. Okay, the non-work-related fatalities during this period occurred an average of 60 miles offshore. In order for BSEE to determine that a death wasn't work-related, they conduct an investigation. Okay, so here's a, here's an example. A crew member working on a platform 30 miles from shore fell to the deck around 9 p.m. Other workers ran to him, performed CPR when they heard his tools fall. They couldn't revive him, so they said he died of a heart attack. His death was classified as non-occupational and is not included in their offshore incident statistics. Studies show that people who work night shifts are at greater risk for heart attacks, right? So, so there you go. Um, but get a load of this. Um, BSEE doesn't require companies to report worker deaths that occur in state waters. Most states control up to three nautical miles from their coastline. Florida and Texas control nine nautical miles. So those are state waters. Federal waters begin where the state waters end and extend 200 nautical miles offshore. Okay, so they're not even reporting. So BSE, you know, anybody dies in that region, you're not reported. Um, so who does report you? Well, they couldn't find this. They, they investigated. They couldn't find a state agency in Louisiana or Texas that tracks offshore worker deaths either. Spokesman for the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources and the state police said their agencies don't track offshore worker deaths in state waters, nor does the Railroad Commission of Texas, an agency charged with regulating offshore drilling in Texas waters. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration tracks this data, according to the spokesperson uh, 
for the state, but the OSHA didn't respond to requests for comment. So talk about not, re if you don't report deaths, I guess they, they don't happen or whatever. The, uh, you know, as OSHA secretary back at the BP oil spill said the agency had no regulatory or enforcement authority over offshore drilling rigs or production platforms. When the Bureau of Labor Statistics captures data on fatalities in the oil and gas sector, the information is not separated off by onshore and offshore work. Okay, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, do they track it? Well, no, it doesn't look like it. they do. We might track those numbers depending on the nature of the fatality, but they didn't um, fulfill a Freedom of Information Act request for the data from the Coast Guard. Okay, yeah, oil and gas companies say the offshore industry is safer than ever. Offshore work has continued to become safer over time, and this is reflected in the data, regulations, and operations, they say. Okay, there's little evidence to support the claim that the work's gotten safer. The overall self-reported rate of injuries per hours worked by operators dropped by 53% between 2011 and 2019, but about 80% of workers are employed by contractors, not operators. Okay, so the operators don't have the people working directly for them, so they don't have to report fatalities. It's the contractors, and there's a regulation so the contractors report them? No. So anyway, the data looks all rosy and hunky-dory. Four of the offshore workers died who died in 2019 fell from platforms, okay? Um, a worker on the night shift in May 2019 fell through a corroded section of grading on a platform 80 miles off the coast of Louisiana. Less than 24 hours earlier, a supervisor noticed a section of grading was deteriorating and felt spongy underfoot. Um, tied a piece of red tape to the grading until it could be fixed and the, and the guy didn't notice and fell down um and uh they didn't really you know anyway yeah so it's 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 crazy stuff here um you know it goes on there's lots of other details but you know here here's a this is a chart um Offshore worker fatalities in the Gulf of Mexico from 2005 to 2019. So you can go through, you can see what rigs it happened on, what district, how far offshore, the operator. You know, there's lots of stats here and it goes on for four pages. So this goes from 2005 to 2019. This was a 2021 article. You know, I tried to find something more recent, but there's, there's less and less recently on this sort of stuff. When injuries do occur, the workers are often blamed. And, uh, yeah, so. There seems to be an attitude that people who pay the bill should have the power to decide what risk their workers should take and whether to the report them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, under Trump, the... Um, they put more burden on companies rather than the regulatory bodies and so on. Okay, so we've got problems here. People are dying on these things and the deaths aren't being reported. Meanwhile, let's have a look at what the industry is saying. So this is the BSEE, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. This is their, their stats. So if you look at safety and environmental performance, 2019 chart, basically, look, these are total injury and illness rates, drilling and well, construction, oil and gas production. Great, all the fatality rates and injury rates are going down from 2010 to 2019. You know, uh, total hours, production, work hours per well operation, incident rates, production operators, drilling and well operators. Great, everything's going down, right? I mean, how could, you can't trust any of this data. They're not reporting, <laughs> you know, they're, they're just counting what they want, counting half of what's happening. So anyway, this stuff is all public access. So check it out yourself, it's, it's horrifying. Here's a helicopter 
that went down, you know, report, right? It goes in a local paper, doesn't go very far. So here we go. What is causing these crashes? Well, even low, this is from the, the BSEE webpage, which is part of the U.S. Department of Interior, as I said. So even low levels of combustible gas endanger offshore helicopters. Okay, so there was a, a BCE supported study. It found the presence of methane gas may cause power loss in turboshaft engines at much lower concentrations than originally estimated. You don't need much methane in the air to bring down a helicopter. The study identified mechanisms by which methane ingestion can cause sudden and significant degradation of turboshaft engine performance. Okay, so this is a huge deal. And this is, uh, you know, another site from their page and there's links to uh, the um, articles here. The 2015 study on combustible gas effects on helicopter operations, engineering analysis reports. I don't think this link, the more recent link, the link doesn't even work. Page not found. There you go. Okay, so 2015. So it goes back. I mean, they, they really are not, they're underreporting everything. Now, as gas prices soared in 2022 because of the war in Europe, Nobody knows how much methane is leaking. So here's some infrared images. A Texas oil and gas company, Triple Crown, it discovered it was leaking 20 times more methane than the EPA estimated. After So it began a rigorous leak detection program, the company, and they thought, you know, we're, we're you know, because prices went up. It wasn't because, anyway, prices went up. So they thought, well, we can't waste as much methane. Let's cut back the leak rates. Okay, so here we go. Uh, here's a, so you know this is a great article. Highly recommend you Google this title and check it out. Um, no one knows how long natural gas has been seeping out of a meter at the Greenville Downtown Airport in South Carolina. A satellite chartered by Duke Energy Corporation, the power company for the airport, eventually spotted the billowing greenhouse gas and workers came to fix the leak. Well, it was at an airport. Good job planes didn't blow up because of this. In the intervening time between leak and discovery, an untold amount of methane escaped into the atmosphere. Okay, Duke says it's the first U.S. utility to use satellites to search their own infrastructure for invisible leaks, both to save fuel um, but to help stem global warming. The company's blindness to a dangerous methane plume from its own infrastructure surprised executives. Okay. Those involved in extracting, moving, and burning oil and gas aren't required to know anything about the actual volume of planet warming pollution being released into the air. Okay, this is, cr this is absolutely insane from coming for, for the oil and gas industry to, to behave this way. The methane menace, lost gas from gaping leaps, leaks in pipelines and storage tanks isn't just a climate catastrophe, it's now an acute economic setback as well. Okay, so this was two months after Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, U.S. natural gas futures hit a high and they thought, suddenly thought, well, let's see how much we're leaking so we can save money. Right. Um, even with new methane detecting technologies available, companies aren't obligated to physically monitor infrastructure and federal regulators rarely collect data of their own. Disclosure comes down to companies simply tallying figures. For example, how many gas wells they have and applying an outdated formula developed by the EPA that assigns an assumed emissions rates. So they are undercounting U.S. methane emissions by at least 50%. Same in Canada, same probably all over the world. So no wonder why, you know, methane is, is, is on a surge upwards. Um, you know, at the U.N. climate conference in Glasgow, so not the last one, but next to the last one, 100 countries pledged to cut methane emissions 30% by the end of the decade. Well, it seems like we could do this in a year if we just monitored the sites or had somebody monitor every site um, and just tell people you got the leak here, 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 and the leak's just fixed up. We'd probably drop it more than 30%, probably 50%. <laughs> 
You know, it can happen right away. Um, U.S. regulators are working under a flawed set, set of assumptions. Energy companies calculate emissions to regulators using equations for infrastructure in a well-maintained condition. Ruptures showing, are showing up in pipelines and compressor stations all over the country. We don't really know how much methane is coming out of fossil fuel systems because they leak. So here is a Cairo's aerospace, an airplane mounted sensor. That's all you need. And camera technology uses a spectrometer to precisely map emissions and identify the source. So you can just tack this on the, on the, on the strut of a Cessna fly over all these wells and, and find out which ones are leaking and, and cap them the next day. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, people, you know, but it's just, it's just not being done. So leak conscious energy companies can be surprised when they survey their operations. So Triple Crown Resources is an oil and gas driller in, with, in the Permian Basin. They've invested heavily to make sure they can store natural gas properly. They hired Cairo's Aerospace to fly small planes over its system with infrared methane detecting cameras in 2020. They expected a leak rate to be pretty close to what it calculated using the EPA equation, 0.2% of the total gas. Well, what did they measure? They found over 4% leak rates. And this is a good company that, that is care, cares about their emissions. They still got 4%. Right, they just fixed the leaks. They sent workers to fix a leak and installed sensors to continuously monitor for methane. They saved about 1.8 million by preventing 400 million cubic feet of gas from escaping. So here's some pipe, here's some infrastructure. Look at, this is all methane leaking. They just capped the leak and there you go, nothing. Right, easy peasy. The point two figure is from the EPA. It, right, it's perverse. The method of calculating emissions preferred by the U.S. regulator is perverse because it creates a false sense of security. The, EP, the EPA says I'm good, I'm, so I'm not doing S hyphen hyphen T. T says, summarizing the views of other Permian Basin operators. Okay, so this is like crazy. Um, the agency estimates that 1.4% of all natural gas produced in the U.S. is leaked into the air. But, you know, Stanford researchers, they use these infrared cameras on small planes. They looked at 26,000 oil and gas wells. They found the figure was likely much higher, much higher at 9%. 9% leakage, you know, so methane's worse than coal, you know, if you have leak rates like that. Right, and this is uh, this is some of the sites. This is a map of various sites. Accumulated methane leaks by volume across the continental U.S. identified by Kairos from January 2019 to April 2022. So there you go. Where's where's the date on here? I don't see the date. Okay, so they're just cumulative methane. So the country's like Swiss cheese. Right, all of these holes in the ground for the oil and gas industry, they're leaking methane like crazy. No wonder why methane is on a tier. You know, other countries are, you know, what's Russia like? Probably even worse. <laughs> all right, it's a story repeated all over the globe. Big leaks and releases in Russia, Kazakhstan, and Iran increase these countries methane emissions by as much as 20% compared with initial official national figures reported to the UN. Super leaks in Turkmenistan have doubled its annual carbon output. Research in Canada measured methane emissions at 7,000 sites across Canada's oil and gas structure. Industry underestimated actual emissions by a factor of 1.5. This chronic undercounting calls into question the very idea that natural gas is a cleaner alternative to coal. Gas leakage of more than 3% makes fuel methane worse for the climate than coal. So natural gas is worse for the climate than coal. It's much, much worse for the climate than coal because leak rates are, you know, what, 9%, 23% in the, in, in, in the oil rig, 9% in the Permian Basin. Okay, so, and these sensors are great. Um, the methane, the, it, they can detect leaks as small as 40 parts per million. 
accurate enough to tie it to an individual meter on one home in a neighborhood full of houses, for example. We will all be better off, regardless of the size, getting rid of these methane leaks. Okay, so satellites can, can monitor it. You can see where the big leaks are. Duke buys one flyover a month from a worldview satellite, gathers images from about 400 miles from the Earth. Uh, Microsoft and Accenture crunch the data, identify which of the methane plumes spotted by satellite are coming from its sites, so and then they fix the leak. Okay, I mean, the technology is great now. So the methane leaks are far worse in estimates, at least in New Mexico, but there's hope. So this talks about the Stanford researcher study using airborne sensors to see methane from the air. Again, this is the sensor here. And, um, you know, it's very, very simple technology. So let's look at that, some papers. So, so this, is a, uh, this is a paper here. Um, so here's a test. Single blind test of airplane-based hyperspectral methane detection via controlled releases. So uh, point sources in the oil and gas industry are major contributors to global greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, the majority of such emissions come from a small fraction of super emitting sources. So they looked, uh, they used Cairo's Aerospace's hyperspectral imaging methane emission detection system. I guess you, they just rented it. They got methane fluxes from 18 to 1,025 kilograms per hour. They did blinded controlled releases of methane over four days and saw what the sensors saw. They detected 182 of 200 valid non-zero releases, all 173 over 15 kilogram per hour uh, per meter per second of wind speed. None, right, and, and non-zero release sites below uh, 8.3 kilograms per hour weren't detected. Um, there were no false positives. Okay, so basically they released methane at selected sites with different wind speeds and they measured it to test their equipment. And, you know, look at the gas production here. U.S. natural gas production, it reached 40.1 trillion cubic feet in 2019 a 56% increase since 2009. Okay, so why is methane going up so much? Well, here's why. Leak rates from this gas production in the US and probably in every other country of the world is, is ridiculously high. And we have easy, cheap technology to detect these leaks and to close them up. It should be mandatory for every single place. What is wrong with our governments? Do they just not care? Are they stupid? <sighs> okay. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at this study. So so they use the Kairos uh, material, you know, sensor, and let's see what they got. So there's no meth here's no methane coming out here. This is meters per second wind speed. Then, so the time given, you know, um, so a little bit of methane's coming out here. Can't really detect it. And here that you see it, okay? This is it here. Uh, confidence in methane presence, different wind speeds here. Okay, so they measured the, um, how well they could localize onto a region, how, how much methane they could detect. So here is the reported release rate in kilograms per hour, and this is the actual leak rate because it was controlled releases and uh, line up nicely here. You know, um, you know, great, you know, very good method. Okay, um, so it works. You can easily detect the amount of methane leakage by these airborne sensors with spectrometers on them. Okay, so and here they use this similar technology to um, quantify regional methane emissions in the New Mexico Permian Basin with the aerial survey. So this is a 2022 paper. Okay, so they use a basin-wide, the Permian Basin Airborne Survey of Oil and Gas Extraction and Transportation Activities in the Permian Basin, spanning you know, a huge area, 26,292 active wells, 15,000 kilometers of pipeline, 
Um, and this airborne survey repeatedly visited over 90% of the active wells from October 2018 to January 2020, 98,000 well site visits. They estimated total oil and gas methane emissions at 194 metric tons per hour, or 9.4% of gross gas production. So the leak rate was 9.4% over the entire Permian Basin that they measured here. Okay, this is crazy. 50% of these emissions came from large emission sources or super emitters with persistence average emission rates over 308 kilograms per hour. Okay, so here's an example, 678 kilograms per hour, the wind 2.2 meters per second this way, you know, a huge, huge emission. Um, here's the region and here's the Permian Basin, cover, you know, crossing New Mexico, Texas, there's other basins, but the study area was here. And here's an imp, some image from the study area, how many site visits they had. So, so quite a few, up to 16 in some cases. And here's the uh, emissions that they, here, here's emissions from the study area. You know, super emitters, the big circles, you know, it's, it's like perforated. No wonder why methane in the atmosphere is so high. Okay, they found 2,874 methane plumes above 100 kilograms per hour. 457 above 1,000 kilograms per hour, larger than any observation previously found in ground-based methane surveys. Okay, so they're finding this is much more um, significant than doing ground-based surveys. You, you just you can cover huge amounts of ground from the air. Across many studies, the top 5% of sources contribute over 50% of the emissions. Okay, so basically, here's uh, some of the data, methane emissions, this is tons per hour. So they looked at well sites, gas processing plants, compressor stations, storage tanks, pipelines, it's coming from everywhere. <laughs> you know, and they, this is a logarithmic scale for the tons per hour of methane released. Right, and... Uh, the, you know, tables and charts and data, you know, you get the idea. It's like Swiss cheese. The methane menace. An empire of dying wells is cooking the planet and making one man very rich. Well, the guy with the infrared camera that is surveying the sites, the one guy, is becoming very rich, right, because of the, the methane menace. And there's a lot of methane. This is Bloomberg. There's lots of articles on methane hunters and Methane. McDonald's struggles to fix its massive methane problem. The cheap and easy climate fix that can cool the planet. I mean, we it's, it's just a no-brainer to plug these holes, detect them. Here is the offshore platforms in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, 2020 assessment. Um, they, they, and uh, they found that, um, yeah, so they did the same thing as in the Permian Basin. All of these are open source. You can just have a, have a look at them. So here's some offshore regions, there's different oil rigs, there's different stuff, different infrastructure for the oil and gas industry. Here's some methane spiraling upwards and the concentrations with, with altitude, you know, all the way up, you know, this is going up 250 meters. And what else did they detect? Oh, uh, you know, um, aerial measurements, surveys, they compared it to other measurement techniques. So here's some different data from before in the aerial measurements. They found much higher leak rates from the aerial measurements, probably the most accurate. Okay, so um, here's a paper, Environmental Research Letters, Methane Remote Sensing and Emission Quantification of Offshore Shallow Water Oil and Gas Platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so this is a 2022 article, I believe. Okay, so let's just have a look through at some of the figures. Uh, okay, flight geometry, you've got your plane here, the sun's here, different uh, geometries and how you're collecting the data. Offshore platform targets. 
methane plumes. So here's some examples. Um, here's a methane plume from uh, A is um, a, a plume from a vent, um, November 2nd, 2021, with an emission rate of 3157 kilograms per hour. Huge amounts of methane coming up. This is parts per million in the different region. So if you have a chopper anywhere near here, you're kaput. Um, this is a plume from a tank, is B. Okay, this is a plume from, oh, I just, my, my CO2 sensor just beeped. So you can see how long this video is, and you can see we're at 1422 parts per million in the room right now, and it's still going up. I set it to beep at 1400. So if I start rambling and I mean, start to be incoherent, it's because the video is too long. I think this is my longest video ever, but I'm just going to continue it with, with the data. So I'm almost finished. Um, this is a plume from a satellite well, so a well that's separate, maybe it's not even being used. A plume from a pipeline, okay? The small white dot at the plume origin right here is bubbling water. So if a plane's flying trying to find the bubbling water, right, well, what's the point? Just use an infrared camera and see the whole plume, right? It's, that's a 1400 kilogram per hour leak. Average emission rate per source, right? Emission rate. So the, the so look at the emission rate, super high in these regions, right? Here's the scale. You know, this is, this is two over two thousand kilograms per hour. All plumes, persistent sources, and so on. So here's here's a here's a vent venting. The booms here, and you can see all the methane, the tank, the well, and the pipeline. Okay, um, yeah, so it's very, you know, like, look at this stuff. It's horrifying. Improvements needed. Okay, so the BS, uh, the, the U.S. Department of the Interior, this is, again, the BSEE, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, the BSEE, Procedures Concerning Offshore Venting. So they uh, recommended some stuff based on crashes and stuff. And basically, uh, none of it was really implemented. Okay. Um, they did a, a detailed report on the helicopter crashes, 105 page report. You can just Google the title and find it. The study of, on effects of combustible gas on helicopter operations. So they looked at all these different crashes. They looked at all these different case studies. You know, here's a, a Bell helicopter shortly after takeoff from an offshore platform, crashed, right, just dropped out of the sky. Sometimes there's, there's booms, little, there's small booms, um, and, uh, you know, they, let me just go and let's see. Yeah, so there's diagrams showing what's happening. So they analyzed it and they made some recommendations. And uh, let me go to, um, you know, where the wind is, where the methane is coming from, how it is around the oil rig. It's very detailed. Um, basically, what's happening is that, um, page, yeah, here, I, okay, so here's the typical uh, engine. Right, so you have an air inlet, you've got a compressor Compressor here, it compresses the gases, then the gases go in the combustion chamber, right, and it turns the uh, assembly gearbox, turns, turns the shaft for the rotor, helicopter engine, exhaust outlet here. So, of course, in here we have high temperatures, so any methane coming in here, it's compressed. If it doesn't explode here, it makes it into the engine, no problem. Right, it should be okay. But what happens is it gets compressed to high enough uh, temperatures that it can self-ignite in here, or not self-ignite, it ignites here, and causes a boom before it goes in and the helicopter loses power and crashes. So basically things like that have been happening um, and are still happening. Okay, uh, lots of stuff on here. Effects of methane ingestion on turbo shaft power so you can have a look you know if this is if this you know there's lots of stuff in here
pictures of the oil rigs, the types of engines operating on the different uh, helicopters, you know, the, the weights, etc., the airframe. So these are helicopters. Okay, all these different types of helicopters, the capacity, all the details. Okay, so the boom here. So these things, yeah, basically there's one here still in the air, right? So these things are still uh, basically dropping, not like flies, but dropping, you know, they're crashing. People are dying. And, uh, you know, they could just use infrared cameras to see, well, they can stop the venting. Or at least, you know, there's so many things that they can do. Anyway, have you can have a look at that report. So where did this report was in 2015? Okay, so what was the response? Uh, this is the response right here. A couple of years later, a letter to the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement saying the Offshore Operators Committee the American Petroleum Institute, the National Ocean Industries Association, Oil and Gas Association, they're saying that uh, they're doing enough, right? They're basically just, they're, they're saying, you know, that it won't help. They're saying that um, they're discounting a whole bunch of events. They're saying there were only two recorded events in the last six years that were a problem. They talk about safety records. So here's some of the things that they do. So they, they, they discount, look at this. There is a crash, unidentified facility, power loss undetermined. It says if there's no mention of flares from the rig, then they discount it. This incident should not have been included. Loss of power due to ingestion of exhaust fumes from a flare boom. Okay, they said that... Uh, this infinite yeah this is one of the ones they talk about that passes uh, no mention of flares so they discount it no mention of flares they discount it so they discounted all of these crashes so there's a whole bunch of crashes and here's what the oil and gas industry does they say yeah they're most of them they shouldn't be included in the analysis discount them discount them discount them right and gas detection won't help but you know procedures should help so like, like seriously, I mean, this, this is like, and they make their recommendations, just come up wind and, you know, have better training for pilots and stuff. And yeah, you don't need methane sensors on the helicopter. Anyway, I've gone way over. We got, we clearly have a problem in the oil industry, in the Permian Basin with both onshore and offshore um wells platforms etc leaking methane like crazy way way above uh any sort of estimates what the epa is saying what other groups are saying we have very simple inexpensive technology uh using lasers uh to to, to just measure the methane and we can run them we can get accurate data from aircraft or even from satellite see the huge leaks and just cap the leaks why, why isn't this regulated now in every country and then we might see the methane levels not skyrocketing like it's just absurd um it's just it's just crazy so anyway and uh i've taken way too long in this video but uh hopefully you've stuck it out by now and uh you deserve a prize and the prize would be just go to my website and uh you know kick me some uh, money to support my research and videos but with my paypal account you know all of these just these papers all of these articles are, are open source you just have to connect the dots of the data we clearly have a huge methane problem in the oil and gas industry thanks again and bye for now